So we saw that interfaces combined with a private class can give you regulated access to the contents of an object. So you can export a private class that implements an interface and through the interface uh, another object can come to know about the functions that are available and because this is a private class exported by the object, this private class has access to the internal structure. So if you want to for example uh, look up things inside the object, you can do it in a regulated way using this interface. Now let us look at another example of using interfaces and this is something called callbacks. So when we set a timer in real life, supposing we are doing something in the kitchen and we set a timer, then usually what happens is that we put the cooker on the gas and then we say we want to switch it off after 10 minutes. So we will set a timer for 10 minutes and then we will go about doing whatever we are doing and at the end of the 10 minutes we expect that this timer will ring or somehow tell us that the time has elapsed and then we can get back and attend to whatever we are supposed like switch off the gas or whatever. So we want to do a similar thing in a Java or an object oriented environment. So this class right, is trying to do something for which it needs some time to elapse. So what my class does is it creates a timer object. So timer is another class, it creates a timer object t and it starts it off. So it starts it off in this case let us assume it is a simple timer with a fixed time limit. So otherwise you could imagine that there is an argument here which tells you how much time I want it to run for. But let us for the moment let us just avoid that. So it is going to run for a fixed amount of time. Of course uh, there is another complication which is that this timer in real life is running in parallel with whatever we are doing on the side. So we are kind of waiting to switch off the gas but we are doing something else, we are chopping something or we have gone out and we are uh, talking to someone on the phone or something. Now in a Java kind of environment what you want is that this timer will run in parallel with whatever my class is doing internally. So that requires a different type of execution model. So we will talk about it later how to start a computation which runs in parallel in a parallel thread as it is called. Okay? But for the moment let us assume now that my class is running and doing something else and timer is running and it is keeping time. So it has been started at some time and now when the time elapses it has to come back and tell the class that it is done. So this has to in turn come back and call a function. So we have to assume that the class which created the timer implements some kind of a function which is callable by the timer. So the timer knows what to do. Right? It knows that it should go back to the calling class, the class that created it and call in this case a function called timer done. So timer done will now have some code which my class will execute indicating that it is aware of the timer having elapsed and whatever it needed to do after the timer elapsed. Right? So this is the kind of scenario that we want to program. So the question really is, so this is called a callback. right? So when we have this uh, kind of a function which comes back, so we create an object, we run it in parallel. And then we expect that parallel, that parallel object to call us back when it is done. Right? So this is a very typical scenario you can imagine and this is one concrete simple example of this. So here is some plausible code for my class. Right? So you have some function which is running inside my class and at some point right, it defines a new timer and starts it. Okay. So timer is a class which it knows about, so it creates a new timer and what is it doing? Well it is trying to tell this timer that this is the object that created the timer because the timer needs to be know who to notify, which object to notify at the end of its execution. Right. So this passes this class, this object of this class, when it creates a timer it will pass its own identity through the parameter, the constructor of the timer. Okay. So it starts it off and it has a separate implementation of the function which the timer is supposed to call when it finishes. So timer done is now provided as a function inside my class. So if you look at the corresponding code in timer, right, it will have a constructor right, and this constructor will take as a parameter the name of the object that created it. Right. So it creeps, it keeps an owner as a, an instance variable. And now it starts and when start finishes execution, right, it reaches the end and it calls back this owner with this function timer done. So this is part of the specification of my class that it has this timer done. So therefore timer knows it can call it back. So there is a small problem with this particular implementation which is that 
Inside timer, I have hardwired the notion that it is created by an object of type my class. Right? So, I have a timer which will work only with my class. Of course, this paradigm of calling a timer and doing a callback is general. So, we can imagine many classes might want to do something like this. So, it would be good to have a timer class which works with multiple owner classes. Right? So, we want a kind of a generic version of the timer. So, we know from experience that we have this Java class hierarchy. So, we can make the owner of this timer class generic by allowing the owner to be of arbitrary type object. Right? So, what we have is that the constructor now takes any object as the owner. Right? So, the owner type is now object inside the class. Everything else is the same from my class's point of view. So, my class creates a timer, passes its own reference and starts it and then waits for timer data. Now, the problem is that in this case, right, the timer has to at the end call timer done, but all it knows about its calling class is that it is an object and obviously, the generic object class in Java need not have this very specific function which we have created called timer done. So, we have to cast it. right? So, this is a problem here. We have to do this extra cast and now again we are stuck because we need to cast it back to the class set called. Earlier we were trying to avoid having a dependence on the class set called by allowing this to be an arbitrary object. But when we call it back, we need to know that this function is there. Right? So, we need to know that the calling object has a capability and we need to invoke it. And to invoke it, we have to cast it back. So, this is again a typical situation which is asking for an interface because we want some capability of this class. We want the, the my class has a capability to be informed through timer done. So, that is what we need to know about it. right? So, an interface captures this kind of limited capability. So, the natural solution to this now is to do this whole thing using interfaces. So, we create an interface which pertains to classes which can call timers. So, we call it timer owner. So, timer owner is any class which can launch a timer and which is guaranteed now to implement this function timer done which the timer will call back. Right? So, this is the property that the timer needs. The owner must be capable of executing the function timer done. So, now we make our class that we started with my class implement this interface. So, implement timer owner. So, in particular inside nothing changes. Right? It still has a timer done function and this timer done now satisfies the property that it concretizes the abstract function that the interface promises. So, everything else is the same except for the fact that you have kind of implemented this my timer owner, nothing changes from the perspective of my class. So, what happens in the timer now is that we have this timer owner now as the type of the owner class. Right? So, timer owner is now the parameter which comes in and it is now assigned to this owner instance variable. But because timer owner is an interface which is guaranteed to have timer done, at the end I can just call owner dot timer done without doing any casting because owner is compatible with the interface timer owner and therefore, it has an implementation of timer done. So, in this way we neatly combine the two requirements that we had that we have a kind of generic timer. It, this timer can be used by any class which implements this timer owner interface and the timer need not know anything more about the class that calls it except that it implements its interface. So, I forgot to mention that there is one piece of code here which is there in the timer definition. So, it implements an interface called runnable. So, this is an internal Java interface that we will read uh, learn about later on and this is what allows timer to run in parallel. So, this is something which uh, is just there to for completeness, but at the moment we have not discussed exactly what runnable means. It is not relevant to this. You just have to take it on faith that if timer implements runnable, you can actually launch this timer in parallel so that there is some meaning to this calling back. See normally when we call a function, the code that calls the function is suspended. So, the callback is kind of implicit. right? So, if I write uh, x is equal to f of y right as an assignment. It means that this assignment statement gets suspended until this f completes. So, the callback effectively resumes the execution of the code that you suspended. So, every function suspends the current code, calls a function and then comes back. Here we have a different situation where we, we call a function 
right? And then we continue to run and then at some point later in our behavior, we get called back and then we have to take some action based on that. So that is the difference between this and a conventional call. So it is crucial that the object that we are invoking through this is running in parallel because otherwise the callback is very simple. Right? So we want it to be running in parallel with the, mission, the, with the timer so that the timer can come back and somehow interrupt our execution. Okay? So in general this is a situation that happens whenever we have this kind of parallelism. We want to do many things. So imagine for instance in a browser. right? So you have a browser right? and then you click on a download button. Right? So now this thing will start downloading. Of course, when it's downloading, it doesn't stop you from opening another tab and seeing another window. So you're reading something else. At some point, you realize this download is taking too long. Maybe it's a very large file you did not anticipate or there's some slow connection or something. So now you can go there right? and you can click a stop download button. Right? So this stop download button will effectively notify the download process that it must stop. So this is again something which is happening in parallel. The browser in parallel is displaying some interesting information to you in one window. And somewhere else in the background it's downloading something. So you want to kind of go back to that process and in this case it's not automatic, it's manual, but it's triggered by some action you do. So when you click on that button, internally a function gets called in the download process and terminates it. So calling back or interrupting through a function which comes back is a very essential thing you do whenever you want to do things in parallel. And of course, the reason you want to do things in parallel is so that you can optimize the resources. I mean, no computer is kind of uh, uh, doing anything sequentially. Every time we use a computer, we are implicitly doing lots of things because it is, for instance, the background is typically checking whether new mail has arrived for us, it's running a clock, it's doing various things, right? So there is always this illusion of parallelism, even though it might be doing only one thing at a time is doing it so fast that it keeps switching back and forth and you think it's doing many things at the same time. So the critical capability we want is that that spawned object must be able to go back and notify the owner. Right? Now in this case the owner was the object that created the timer but in principle I could have an owner right, or a, a, a creator in some sense, a creator which creates a timer and tells it to notify somebody else. Right? So there is no reason why the object that is passed to the timer must be the object that called it. So in general you can say when you are done, pass on a message to somebody else right? So or it might say create something else. So therefore this owner is an abstract thing, it is not necessarily the class that called the timer. Okay? So all we want is that the timer should know that whichever object it has to notify has the capability of being notified and that is what we achieve by making that an interface.